morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Institute of Aquaculture's Big Fish Series Seminar, Is Aquaculture Breaking into the Global Food System? Before we start, and while we wait for others to join, can I invite you to interact with us? You can do this in two ways. You can post general comments in the chat function and specific questions in the Q&A box. Our panelists that include authors of the Nature article will do their best to address these questions in real time. We'll also have time later on in the seminar to follow up on key issues arising with the panel. Full bios of all the panelists are on the Big Fish seminar website, the link to which will be in the chat now. So my name is Dave Little and I'm at the Institute of Agriculture, the University of Stirling, and I'll be hosting today's event. We start with a short video in which Ros Naylor, who's founding director of the Center of Food Security and Environment at Stanford University, gives you an overview based on a recent review paper published in Nature, which she led. We then hear brief perspectives and opinions from voices around the world from those whose lives are dependent on seafood. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm very happy to be presenting in the Big Fish series on a paper I've been working with a set of colleagues on, on a 20 year retrospective review of global aquaculture. Here's the list of my colleagues, an outstanding group, and this paper was published last week in Nature. To give you a sense of our retrospective review, we're following up on a review that was written uh, by myself and other colleagues in the year 2000, also published in Nature, on the effect of aquaculture on world fish supplies. And this paper largely focused on the sustainability of aquaculture in relation to wild fish and the use of wild fish in feeds. Its geography focused mainly on coastal and ocean ecosystems. So as we look forward and now look at the past 20 years, we've taken a much broader view of aquaculture. And I think the bottom line is that the volume of global aquaculture has tripled since the year 2000. And there's been positive trends in environmental performance. And so the fact that the sector is expanding and it's expanding in an environmentally sound direction has really been a profound result. It, there are still mounting issues associated with pathogen management, pollution, climate change, and increasing dependence on land-based resources, which I'll talk about. So the data are all in the paper, but I just wanna uh, point out three trends. One on the left is just the threefold increase in production, largely by species that are naturally low in the trophic web. And if you look at the top right, um, the volume in terms of sheer volume of production, most of that volume has been coming from freshwater aquaculture. And in the bottom right, we can see that other species like crustaceans, diagemous fish, marine fish, lower volume, but very rapid growth. So what have been the major trends that we've seen? The first trend really is on the freshwater aquaculture. And this was an area that we touched upon in the earlier review, but didn't really focus on. And I don't think any of us would have guessed just how profound the growth in freshwater aquaculture would be. This is a great shot from Bangladesh, huge expansion. And it's not just in terms of fish supplies, it's in terms of the whole value chain from the inputs to production all the way through to the final consumers, many of whom are now in urban areas. But we call this the hidden revolution because when we actually look through all the literature, over 11,000 articles written in English um, that have aquaculture in their titles, three quarters of those have focused on mariculture and 68 on high valued mariculture like shrimp and salmon. So really overlooking in a relative sense, this very important freshwater sector. And freshwater is incredibly diverse, accounting for almost 40% of live weight production, but 75% of edible production coming out of aquaculture. So really, really important in Asia, Africa, Latin America, really all over the world. 
And the sustainability dimensions of this freshwater sector have been less intensely studied than marine, um, but are important. And uh, you can see here that most of these systems are confined, but there are some trends uh, that are worth looking into. For example, um, just the in increasing intensification of production and pollution, mainly when these are in public water resources. So this is aquaculture in the Jati Lahore Reservoir in Indonesia. And if you look closely and see all the dots in the reservoir, those are all net pens, overly intensified production. So you'll see issues in places like that. But then more generally, aquaculture in freshwater systems has relied increasingly on feeds, over 90% of tilapia, over 80% of pangasis or catfish relies on commercial feeds or homemade feeds that are supplementing the nutrients. This can also lead to pollution, but requires some inputs in the feed area. So the first trend is on freshwater aquaculture. The second trend that we focus on is on fed aquaculture and the use of feeds, really going back to our earlier review. And there's been some very important changes here over the past 20 years. Feed conversion ratios have improved in all fed species. And fish meal protein has been replaced by plant pr proteins and animal proteins and trimmings from fish processing plants. So for example, tilapia feeds um, are comprised three quarters of trimmings now. So trimmings are really contributing a lot to the fish inputs there. And fish meal and fish oil inclusion in feeds has also been going down. Now it can't go down to nothing, particularly for naturally pasivorous fish. Uh, because there are compromises to health and productivity of these species, but also in terms of the taste of those species. Still, when you look at all these nutritional improvements and the alternative feeds, we found that the fish in, fish out ratio relative to our earlier review have gone down from 1.9 in 1997. That means 1.9 tons of wild fish going in to make one ton of farm fish. And that's gone down to 0 0.28, a phenomenal improvement over this period. Now with these improvements, the annual catch of forage fish used to make fish meal and fish oil declined over the period from 23 to 16 million tons. But the share of global fish meal and fish oil used by the aquaculture sector, as opposed to livestock, went up from 33% to 69% for fish meal and from 55% to 75% for fish oil. So there still is a dependence on fish meal and fish oil by the sector. Now the improvements that we've seen have not just been because the industry is committed to sustainability, although many parts of it really are, but it's also driven by the economics. In the earlier period that we looked at in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, fish meal was relatively inexpensive. But now when you look at all the alternative ingredients listed in this table here um, from animals and from plants, and you look at their crude protein and costs, the um, cost per kilogram of protein is much less expensive when you're not using say anchovy meal, which can be two to three times more expensive than these alternatives. And we've seen the cost of fish meal and fish oil from fish-based resources be much higher, substantially higher than plant-based alternatives for the past decade. So the economics is really pushing us in this direction too. Now there's been a much tighter connection formed between land and sea. Aquaculture is relying on corn and soy-based proteins with the kinds of environmental issues that you might see in livestock and crop agriculture, nutrient release in dead zones or deforestation. So the Norwegian salmon industry, for example, has been able to move completely off of fish feeds, but as it moves into soy-based proteins that are non-GMO produced in Brazil, they are getting heat from environmental groups for contributing to deforestation. So there are these trade-offs that get made. Now, thinking of the commercial use of feeds uh, by aquaculture, they only use about 5% of total commercial feeds, much less than the land-based animals do, but this is likely to change over time. 
There's other promising inputs for aqua feeds, insect feeds, algae feeds, but again, the nutritional quality and the economics has to work. So the third major trend, we have freshwater, we have the feeds, and then we have the extractive species, seaweeds and mollusks that don't require feeds. As we look at the past 20 years in these categories, we see unrealized potential. Um, there's been relatively low production growth of these categories and relatively low edible weight conversion. Um, and in some cases, they just need more value. So seaweeds, for example, needs a biorefinery approach, needs the seaweed producers need to gain more value out of their production. Both of these categories um, provide e really important ecosystem services, nutrient assimilation, for example. It does require scale to get those ecosystem services. A lot more needs to be studied on them, but most important producers need to actually capture the value from providing these ecosystem services. So overall, there's been rapid innovation in aquaculture, but still some persistent challenges and uncertainties associated, for example, pest, pathogen, parasites. The first line of defense is often using antibiotics or antimicrobials, and there's an increasing fears of resistance, antibiotic resistance coming from aquaculture. Very little good data and reporting across the board, and governance is really important here. So some species like salmon, again, in Norway are all vaccinated, but in Chile, they aren't vaccinated as much. And um, so much more work needs to be done in this area. And as we move forward, pollution, harmful algal blooms and climate change, which are being modeled in different ways currently, the evidence will be rolling out and we'll understand these impacts much more moving forward. Of course, the solution is to isolate aquaculture more, put it in raceways to the left or in recirculating aquaculture systems in the top right, or move aquaculture out to these big offshore facilities like you see in Norway or China on the bottom right. But again, the economics has to work. So the final point is on governance and how governance can provide incentives to move towards sustainability. We've seen a lot more public and private sector government strategies emerging. Here we see in the bottom left, the uh, donut showing 3% of aquaculture is currently certified. And those are mainly in the widely traded commodities and more high valued commodities such as shrimp and salmon, pangasis and tilapia. But there are also highly rated and best choice strategies in green and those again mollusks or seaweeds. Um, still 44% are not rated at all so there's a need to increase this area moving forward. So I'll wrap up by just saying we've had three stages of aquaculture. We had the early stage moving towards the turn of the century where some of the environmental issues were starting to become very obvious to researchers. And then over the past 20 years, we've documented incredibly uh, sound progress in addressing many of the sustainability issues, but still having some sustainability issues remaining to be solved. And as we go forward 20 years from now with tighter connections to land and sea, what are the issues that we need to be worried about within the whole global food system? Will aquaculture follow the path of terrestrial crop and animal production systems in terms of feed and genetics or environmental externalities? Who will dominate the sector? Will multinationals dominate or will smallholders remain very important? What will be the role of siting in a more populous world with so many competing demands on resources? And finally, in terms of the commitment to sustainability, where will there be a demand for sustainable products and will the economics work? So I'm gonna leave these issues to the panelists to address, but I just wanna end by giving very, very special thanks to my colleagues on the paper um, in the uh, left-hand column and also to my colleagues on the earlier review who really set this discourse in motion. So thank you very much. Hi, I'm Jack Morales from the Philippines. Over the past 20 years, the Philippines has experienced rapid and consistent growth in the number of aquaculture practitioners and increasingly intensive farming methods. Even though the production from aquaculture is increasing, the price 
has remained quite constant. This has resulted in easier access to food in general and animal protein in particular, especially now that poultry and swine are both facing diseases issues and aquaculturists transform the livelihoods of those working directly in the industry. But there are also uh, individuals that are indirectly connected. Hello, I'm Mamun. Uh, aquaculture has been uh, intensified quite rapidly here in Bangladesh in last two decades. Family-driven small-scale polyculture system has been shifted to monoculture system. Few larger species like pangasius and tilapia is playing a key role for the supplying of food fish. It has been created an affordable fish option for many poorer. At the same time, it has created a very good livelihood options for urban and rural poor people. So fish is playing still a vital role for the food and nutritional security and livelihood aspect of many peoples here in Bangladesh. Over the last 20 years, there's been a fourfold increase in global salmon production. And at the same time, we've been able to reduce the marine content in our salmon diets by 80%. Today, the marine content in our salmon diets contains around 35% byproducts. Our strategic focus for the next 10 years is to reduce the environmental footprint of salmon farming through our Sea Further Sustainability Initiative. My name is Nick Mendoza. Consumers even just in the three years that we've been doing this have become incredibly more sophisticated in their understanding of what aquaculture is, kind of the global scale of it, particularly with macroalgae and seaweeds um, and bivalves, but just a, a broader interest, but also, um, you know, a lot of misinformation out there and continued confusion uh, about, you know, what it means to be um, sustainably sourced or, you know, what it means to know where your seafood is coming from. Um, but in general, uh, you know, a major increase in people's interest in learning uh, about aquaculture. I think the major change in aquaculture since the 1990s when I started has been the increase in the number of farmers. Uh, farming shrimp, for example, is akin to a crop of corn, and the farmers have been able to make more money with aquaculture than traditional crops, and therefore they increase, is the way I see it. Fish is the main source of protein to many Ghanaians. There is increasing demand for tilapia and cut fish. There is no single menu that has been designed for party or an event without having tilapia or catfish on the menu. Tilapia has become a delicacy. Over the past decade, the aquaculture sector has witnessed significant growth in terms of production. At the moment, farmers in the aquaculture sector are able to export to nearby countries, such as Benin, Togo, Nigeria, and Ivory Coast. Indeed, the aquaculture sector has become very important to the global food system. Well, thanks to all our contributors. Thanks to all our contributors there um, who sent their videos from around the world. And I'd now like to introduce your panel. Um, Michelle Stark, founder and director of Seafood Advisory. Lin Kao, who's associate professor in the School of Oceanography at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. Jose Vianon, corporate Sust sustainability director at the Nutreco. Uh, based in Amsterdam. Pitt Cohen, who's a research leader at Worldfish Penang, Malaysia. And Fernando Madonez, who's an assistant professor, veterinary epidemiology, Pontifical uh, Catholic University in Santiago, Chile. So thanks for all of you for, for joining and we're very interested to hear what you have to say. And I'm gonna kick off with, with Jose Vianon and perhaps to ask you, Jose, the terrestrial feed sector has been established for far longer than that of of aquafeeds and relatively receive far more investment. From your perspective, um, how do you see, uh, uh, as a major net international feed company, what do you think the key lessons learned are uh, between the two sectors, between the terrestrial and the aquatic? 
Yeah, thanks, Dave. And, and you're right. Uh, the terrestrial animal feed industry sector has been around for several decades more than the commercial aqua feed sector. The aqua feed sector gained a lot of lessons learned from the terrestrial animal sector, principally in the areas of least cost formulation um, concepts, but also in the technical approaches to the nutritional values of raw materials like chemical composition, digestibility, and the digestibility differences by different age groups in animals. So neither, we can't also either in, exclude the quality criteria such as contaminants, anti-nutritional factors, all of this allowed the aqua feed sector to leapfrog ahead with a short learning curve. But I think in the last two decades, you could safely say that the aqua feed industry has given back by multiples to the general feed sector. Aqua feed, and you could probably even say aquaculture in general, has been under critical and very public scrutiny for over three decades. Most of this scrutiny driven justifiably by the NGO community and academia. Uh, the industry though, I think, reacted favorably and embraced the NGO's community's inputs. This resulted in the formation of general partnerships and multi-stakeholder platforms that allow both sectors to openly and candidly address the outstanding sustainability issues of the day. So mainly some of these issues would be main, uh, overfishing of oceanic fisheries for fish meal and oil, uh, deforestation in the tropics for soy and palm oil, and forced labor and, and, and child labor associated with several of the feed ingredients. Not only though did the industry sector candidly address these issues and continue to do so, but they did so with transparency. And today, I think you can say that the aqua feed industry is in the driver's seat with regard to transparency of ingredients impacts, as well as traceability back to country of origin, and in some cases going back beyond, and encouraging and promoting the incorporation of novel ingredients with which was already mentioned in feeds to address some of the issues that I mentioned earlier. So in addition, the aqua feed industry is leading in the conversation to incorporate life cycle assessment methodology and environmental footprinting criteria in those least cost formulation softwares when formulators are formulating feeds. So that ultimately in the near future, cost is not gonna be necessarily the leading criteria, but also greenhouse gases and land use change, water resources to name a few. So ultimately this works, if this is a work in progress, but when it does launch, it will give the consumers the knowledge of the environmental footprint of the food that they're eating. Thanks, Jose. Um, perhaps uh, we can turn to Ling uh, from, from China. What's, from the perspective of what's the world's biggest aquaculture producer that's so dependent on feed imports? Do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah. China is a leading aquaculture producer and also the biggest aqua feed producer. So in 2019, China total fish feed production exceeded 22 million metric tons, accounting for about 40% of global production. I would like to say China is actually not dependent on feed imports, but on fish meal imports. Um, so fish meal is made from small wild fish and used as a key um, raw material for fish feed. China has fully recognized the issue of overfishing and the importance of fish meal replacement. Therefore, in the past 20 years, China's aquatic animal re uh, nutrition research and feed industry have made great achievements in fish meal substitution and feed innovation, especially in major aquaculture species such as carp and tilapia. But I would like to say there's still a long way to go for marine carnivorous species such as grouper. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Ling. Uh, turning to Fernando, um, from your sort of health perspective, Chile's suffered from long-standing 
health management challenges around its farm salmon sector. What are the most promising areas for long-term improvements in your view? And again, wearing your terrestrial animal health hat, is there anything we can learn from intensive terrestrial livestock here? Hi, Dave. Thanks uh, for being in this fantastic series. Yes, the salmon industry in Chile has faced uh, sanitary problems since the beginning back in the 80s and after 40 years, it seems there are many lessons learned from that, uh, that the industry is taking to become more sustainable. Uh, although knowledge about aquatic pathogens and their hosts has been increasing on time, still is considerably less compared to the human and terrestrial bonds. This is global. As an example, the Aquatic Animal Health Code developed by the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE, was first published in 1995. This is 27 years after the first publication of the Terrestrial Animal Health Code in 1968. So there's a time gap. So um, in this case, terrestrial animal health has a long time development of comprehensive monitoring and surveillance programs, for instance. Uh, this is surveillance has different purposes and components for passive to active surveillance, but also syndromic and risk-based surveillance, among others on the terrestrial side. Now, in aquaculture, to do a well-planned cost-benefit surveillance, it is mandatory throughout knowledge of pathogens and its epidemiology, how pathogens, environment, and the host interact to develop disease. So strict surveillance programs and science-based risk analysis are very relevant tools to avoid the impact of infectious pathogens, not only at the regional or country level, but at the farm itself. Now in Chile, the most critical issue are bacterial infection that promote the use of antimicrobials, which in consequence could select to antimicrobial resistance. Despite the antimicrobials used in Chile are strictly prescribed by veterinarians and only for animal use, and they are not of concern for the World Health Organization, we are aware that chemical spill over into the surrounding environment and to other wildlife and humans uh, must be prevented. So if you can put together surveillance and the example of antimicrobial resistance, you realize that another promising area for long-term improvement is the concept of One Health or the idea of One Health, that our health is intrinsically connected with animals and environmental health. So today we see this with COVID pandemic, an effective One Health approach to fish health surveillance is essential to protect farm animals, wildlife and humans. Uh, this will require a new, more integrated approaches to surveillance than we have seen in the past. It will now take the form of, uh, it will not take the form of a one massive system, rather than the technology is now in place to utilize a more distributed network of system uh, of data and collective wisdom and are shared between animals and human partners in government, industry and the academia. Thanks very much. Uh... Fernando, that was great. Michelle, um, from your perspective, but what types of governance can support improved aquatic animal health management in the sector, do you think? Thanks, Dave. Um, I think there are many different forms of governments, the most obvious being, of course, law and regulation. Um, but there's, of course, also community structures that are very important, community organizations in different areas of the world. But then industry itself, you know, regulating itself, driven by its own goals of uh, productivity or driven by market pressure. And then, of course, there's also certification and rating systems. But I think when you ask which can support, which governments can so support improved health management, I think we really need to distinguish between established farms, which Fernanda was talking about, and as well as new aquaculture. And one lesson I've learned personally is that new producers are highly motivated, um, almost idealistic idealistic to start with, but have this unanimous denial that disease will ever occur at their site. And preventive action is very rarely implemented effectively. In theory it is, in practice it, it isn't. It is afterwards, but not initially. So I think this sort of initial zoning and siting, what the government does, um, is the site suited to the species, the production system, the assimilative capacity, the potentially uh, prevalent disease, that's key for health management. And once these systems are established, for example, the high, high investment salmon, once it's established existing pressures such as jobs, markets, national export value, it does not allow for a reset. And that makes subsequent changes or subsequent 
governance change is very costly for someone or the environment. So the message is get it right from the beginning and, and things will be, be easier to manage afterwards. Pip, from your background uh, in fisheries uh, is really your background. In terms of the global food system, how do you see wild and farmed aquatic products contributing to meeting the needs in common decades? Thanks. Um, I think the short answer is that um, both sustainable wild fisheries and aquaculture are going to be important in the coming decades to meet nutrition and livelihood needs. And so I'm really going to talk here about, about needs and, and not necessarily demand. For the longer answer, I think it's useful to start with this idea of what a food system is. What is that? Because it's a term we're hearing more and more. And a food system is more than just how or how much food or fish in this case we're producing. So it includes the environments, people, their activities from production, distribution, preparation and consumption. So one measure of whether that food system is performing well is, is it environmentally sustainable? And I think the discussion um, that we've just had now and um, the 20 year retrospective review of global aquaculture that um, Ros Naylor um, presented in the, in the opening presentation and opening video, I think um, was quite nicely addressed. But another key measure of the performance of the food system is, is it nourishing people? particularly those people who have few choices in their diets and those that are at risk of malnutrition. So in terms of nutrition, research from our colleagues shows that it's the micronutrients that fish contain that make them particularly valuable to the diets of women and children and men in particular places. And if fish from both wild fisheries and aquaculture were distributed so moved between parts of society even more effectively and equitably than they are now, they could address some incredibly costly and crippling effects of micronutrient deficiencies or what we call hidden hunger. So I think these questions around distribution, affordability, the roles of fish um, in broader diets, preferences and price are going to be really key um, in the next 20 years of aquaculture and wild fisheries research and policy. So alongside the attention that we're giving to production efficiency. So answering the question really, um, who is aquaculture serving fish up to? The other question is whose livelihoods are tied up in aquaculture and in wild fisheries? So what are their experiences of aquaculture as a livelihood, as a way to generate an income? and as a way in which their lands and waters are being used. Are some people winning and then are others perhaps losing out? So you can see I'm bringing kind of a social science perspective to some of these questions. So these two challenges and questions that I'm raising around livelihoods and nutrition reflect the first two and perhaps the most fundamental sustainable development goals, SDG 1 on reducing poverty and SDG 2 on reducing hunger and malnutrition. So to sum up, I think in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, working to govern aquaculture in ways that contribute to these two goals for people and places um, with the greatest needs will be really critical for more attention from the sector. And I think asking, you know, is private sector equipped and motivated to govern um, for poverty alleviation and food and nutrition security? Um, and what is the role of government in that will be really important as well. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Pip. Fernando, continuing this, this discussion around wild and farm fish, how, how important will disease transmission between wild and farm fish be going forward, do you think? Yeah, uh, this is a, a, a two perspective discussion. Uh, it is well recognized and assumed that the close contact between farm and wild fish uh, really leads to pathogen exchange. And this you, ha you have seen this with bacterial viruses and with parasites, where aquaculture create conditions, imagine something with high stock levels, uh, conducive to pathogen transmission and disease. Hence, pathogens can overspill back, resulting in high levels of challenge to white population. Now, this is not only about pathogens. I was talking about bef uh, before the uh, pollutants and, may, uh, and the issue of antimicrobial resistance that can also go in that direction. 
But the, all, the other thing is uh, to look at the other way around. Uh, as aquaculture is increasing, you are starting to uh, culture different species in environment that they are were not existent. Uh, for example, in the Chilean situation, the salmon were not native for our country. So we introduced these species. And you are doing the same with shrimp, with tilapia, with carp, with many other species, even mollusks, to environments where pathogens are already part of the, as a reservoir or carrier is some of the wild fish species. So you are challenging those species uh, be, uh, be raised in those areas. Now, the most difficult part is when you try to do surveillance in those difficult situations. How do you do surveillance on wild fish? They don't die, they don't massively die. So you need to be very smart and very efficient in resource allocation to do surveillance in those environments and understand the complexity of the uh, pathogens exchange between farm and uh, wild fish. Thanks, thanks, Fernando. Um, back to Ling. Most, most aquaculture in China is freshwater, but the country's targeted offshore mariculture is a major sector for investment. What factors are driving this change? And is the Atlantic salmon model developed in Norway a good model? Thanks, Dave. Um, I think there are four main driving factors. Uh, first, China's increasing demand for safe and high quality seafood and fish protein due to rising income and population. At the current consumption level, by 2030, China is estimated to face a full seafood deficit of 20 million metric tons. So where do those fish come from? Uh, so there's no way to come from capture fisheries. So the second uh, main factor is um, China's stagnant capture fisheries. China has suffered from severe, severe overfishing issues. In fact, to help rebuild capture fisheries, China has imposed um, several um, activities, for example, like the 10 year fishing ban in the Yangtze River. Um, so how about inland and near shore systems? The third driving factor is the limited space and also the stricter environmental policies in China. So the growth potential of inland and near shore, near shore systems is limited due to space squeeze from other industries. And China attaches great importance to maintain the uh, red line of 1.8 billion mu of arable lands. So conversion of arable lands to fish pond is completely prohibited in China. And also China has tightened its environmental policies, especially with regard to wastewater dis discharge. Mm -hmm. And the fourth main factor is the water quality in many near shore waters uh, in China is also deteriorating. So grow fish, growing fish in open and nutrient diluted waters with, with higher water exchange rate could help reduce the pressure on near shore systems. Therefore, many stakeholders in China have looked at the open um, ocean aquaculture as an important way to meet the growing domestic demand for quality seafood. And to address your second question, so I think Norway is a leading country in salmon farming and has achieved many much success in farming high value um, salmon in open ocean through the invention of wind and wave resistant cages and innovative farming techniques. Currently, the biggest challenge for offshore aquaculture is economic viability. But for Norway, this doesn't seem to be a big issue. So from the point of view of tech innovation and cost effectiveness, I think Norway is a good model. However, it should be noted that the ecological risks and social impacts of offshore aquaculture remain largely uncertain. Does dilution really mean a solution? At what scale can we avoid repeating mistakes of near shore aquaculture? I think these are some of the key questions that need to be further explored before we can fully launch our offshore strategy. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Ling. Well, we're watching that space with a lot of interest. Uh, Jose, globally, the main farm species are carps, catfish, and tilapia. Do you see this changing in the next two decades or is it, or its geographical concentration in Asia? Is it gonna spread more rapidly elsewhere now? Yeah, I'll be sure. I think, I think that the next two decades, we'll see the African continent becoming much more of a focal point alongside of Asia. Um, though some of the projections I've seen 
still put the population of Africa at half of the population of Asia by 2050, which is much more than two decades, but by 20, 2100, Africa is projected to be almost equal to Asia in population. So both are gonna be very large growth geographies. And I think you're gonna see that the private sector, the private feed sector in particular uh, is investing today in those to ensure that it plays a role in that population growth. Um, in Africa, I think, yeah, freshwater catfish and tilapia will continue to play a large role. In Asia, like Ling said, I think it will be much more diverse, but carp, tilapia, and catfish, I think will ultimately continue to dominate. Okay, interesting. Really following on from that, Michelle, perhaps could you give us your views on, given the faster growth of agriculture products in low and medium income countries, what can be learned about supporting their production sectors towards being more inclusive, ethical, and sustainable business models, in your view? Um, how can we support production in low and medium income countries? I think my immediate answer will be, let's take care of what we ask for. Um, talking from a global trading point of view, rather from a domestic market point of view, we need to be very clear that producers, especially in low and medium income countries, they'll strive to meet buyer demand. This means that purchase requirements are drivers, um, which means we have to ask ourselves, what do we want to drive? Um, so when we set up these purchasing requirements, which do not match production systems, we need to be clear that something needs to give. And uh, maybe just three or four examples that uh, I see very commonly is, you know, if purchasing contracts ask for quantities or timelines for which a producer is not set up for, we can anticipate that this uh, will receive products um, sourced from elsewhere, uh, raising the traceability alert. And when I say that, I mean traceability alert from a production supply chain and importer point of view who is driving that process. So those are drivers. If we set up import or anti-dumping taxes that are as high as 20% for one producer, but not for the other, I leave it up to your imagination what will happen. Um, if we set non-resilient prices, in other words, prices <coughs> taking into account the regular occurrence of disease, which always happens, the need to fallow, which is necessary, the cost for reasonable employment conditions, then we can anticipate that we will not receive sustainable uh, produce product, uh, raising sustainability concerns. Um, or if we forbid the use of antibiotics, um, but not pay the price for the production without the use of antibiotics, then we can anticipate that antibiotics will be used, raising the very well-known uh, residue alarm. Um, so I think one urgent thing that we need to tackle is improve our knowledge on production systems so that we can correct those purchasing expectations. Um, and it's really when those two systems match, the production system matching the purchasing system, it's then that I think we can have an inclusive an arguably more ethical uh, business model. And another point that's always important to me, which I think is really important, is what's the value of our seafood? You know, is a shrimp a shrimp or is a tasty shrimp different from a shrimp? Or what about a healthy shrimp? And, you know, what about a tasty, healthy shrimp produced by smallholders? Smallholders providing for continuation of traditional practices, maintaining their independence and relaving sort of maintaining their livelihoods, is that the same product as an industrially produced, produced shrimp sustaining a fraction of the livelihoods and perhaps even creating irreversible harm to environment and uh, community structures? Or, of course, the other way around, there's a lot of sustainable uh, industrial production. So I think in my perception from that very narrow, narrow view from supply chains, production markets, I think in the past we've failed on qualifying the intrinsic value of a seafood product and because of that we cannot translate it into something that markets and consumers markets and consumers can relate to which means we can't translate it into price necessarily so in short i think there are three things i would say let's take care what we ask for and align purchasing requirements with production systems. Number two, let's get rid of perverse incentives such as bonuses for cheapest purchase. Number three, let's figure out the value of seafood. And 
maybe giving it a slight provocative spin, why don't we turn the question around and ask in the future, how can we support ourselves as aquaculture sectors in low and medium income countries grow? Great. So complexity, um, change, how do we manage that? Um, how do we manage our story uh, within the sector? I think this is a really important thing coming out from what you're saying. Pip, can we envisage a future where small scale fishers coexist positively with aquaculture? And if so, what forms of aquaculture perhaps already exist that, that show this potential? Um, thank you. Um, I actually feel I'd love to hear more from Michelle because I think she was touching really nicely on um, the way in which these models can differ. Um, you know, what are you producing for or how are you setting up the production system and how are you setting up um, and who the consumers are? So um, I think what she was touching on there is um, incredibly important um, to, you know, relate to what I was talking about before, that it's not just volumes, but um, it's about livelihoods. Um, from a development perspective, it's about livelihoods and nutrition. Um, and so to touch on then, um, and I think this reflects the, the different roles in which we see small-scale fisheries playing a role and aquaculture um, playing a role, the, the models that they've kind of fallen into in many contexts. So whilst, both, um, they, whilst they both bring fish to markets and tables, small-scale fisheries and aquaculture can play different and potentially complementary roles. So in Bangladesh, and you, and you saw a video um, from Bangladesh before, a report from the International Food Policy Research Institute suggested that aquaculture development had brought two, two million people out of poverty and increased the volumes of fish produced. At the same time, small-scale fisheries in Bangladesh are still providing livelihoods for many incomes for many, perhaps not incomes that are captured um, in, in national statistics or GDP measures um, because they're relatively small and they're dynamic. Um, and also they're providing nutrient-rich rich fish um, to many people that aquaculture value chains are not necessarily reaching. Um, we also see these different models playing or being impacted um, differently in times of shock. So both each fishery may behave differently. Small-scale fisheries um, can act as a fallback livelihood and food source where the normally high stability of supply that's aimed for in aquaculture to be part of the formal market systems wavered during COVID. And so experiences of shock um, are different and they have different sources of resilience and vulnerability. So I guess, yeah, the question is, can these be governed in a way that they um being complementary in terms of um, the different nutrition functions and the different income provision functions and the different stability or dynamism um, that they play in, in different food systems. That's, that's great. Thanks, Pip. Um, we're going to move now to the open Q&A and we've had some fantastic uh, Q&A coming up that's been questions have been answered. Um, I think we've had over 30 questions. So I'm going to kick off uh, a question to the panel um, that's been top voted up uh, and is how can supply chains and market incentives better support sustainable aquaculture? I wonder if maybe Jose or, or Michelle could take a pop of that one, please. You want to go first, Michelle? Go ahead. Yeah, I think... Um... I think that if we, if we give the consumer or the markets what they want, what uh, it will drive. Um, I'm a very strong ambassador for transparency and traceability of the feed ingredients and the carbon footprint of the feed. As the paper said, the Nader et al. paper, uh, up to 90% is base carbon footprint is on the feed. So. I think what we're going to see in the next five years is an open book concept on traceability and all the way back, you know, what is a carbon footprint of all the ingredients, uh, the risk flags or the, the choke points uh, for, for, for those ingredients so that ultimately the consumer makes that choice. 
think of the, you know, those colorful tags on electrical appliances when you buy uh, in the store for energy efficiency. Can't we see those tags on fish, poultry, pork, and dairy products where you actually see the greenhouse gas emissions per kilo of, of the packaged good on there so that you can drive your decisions when you go through the grocery store. So I think that may be still five, 10 years out, but I think that's where the industry could drive the other terrestrial center plate protein markets towards sustainability. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And um, I, th I think there are two aspects. One is one really big difficulty of when we say what the consumer wants. I, I think the consumer wants what you can understand is a problem. So if, if, if we're not translating and communicating what potential problems they are, there are, they can't be interested in solutions. And if markets can't present how a product is solving something, it just won't fly. It won't fly compared to a product that is not solving that uh, issue. So I think there's a real gap there in terms of information from science, finding it's being translated into something markets and consumers can understand. And I think when we do manage to do that, markets, buyers and consumers are very open to, to, to make a choice and contribute the, the, the right thing. Of, of course, in the, end, in the end, it always comes down to quality and price and food safety. But I think they work together. Both is possible. Thinking further down the line, 10, 10 years ahead, I just think we, we need to move away from uh, to, too, many, too many labels or individual messaging. We have to, a consumer wants to rely on the fact that when they go to a store and buy something that they've done their due diligence on everything. And I think there needs to be much more emphasis on has a due diligence been done uh, according to what message we're giving as a company and, and I think that's a very big next step doing due diligence from A to Z. Thanks great. Um, second voted question is what's the prospects of survival of small-scale aquaculture in South Southeast and Southeast Asian and African countries perhaps perhaps Pip you could uh, have a bash at that one. That's <laughs> hard uh, uh, I probably have more, more, I mean, I'm as interested in the answer of, of, of that as the person who asked it, I think. Um, uh, maybe Michelle would be better equipped to answer it. Um, but, but I do think um, the role of government is going to be important um, and it can be, be potentially deliberately governed in a way that it is um, aquaculture from smallholders, where it is providing employment um, to many. Um, uh, so I think there need to be some decisions made about what role do we want aquaculture to play? Is it just about um, efficiency um, and maximising production um, for a particular set of consumers um, or um, where the private sector um, play a privileged role or is it, um, or are there other ways um, in which to govern it. I think Michelle might be better um, equipped to answer that one. Okay, well, perhaps I'll come back to Michelle. But first, Ling, I mean, I think it's right in saying that still most aquaculture is family farm managed in China. Can you see the, the days when it's going to become corporate and, and the small scale farm is going to be squeezed out? Yeah, I think that's an that's a, um, a issue we discussed um, very often at current stage. Uh, in China, um, because we are promoting offshore aquaculture and we know that offshore aquaculture uh, needs lots of uh, initial investment and there's no way those small scale producers can, can, can I mean, enter this. There's a threshold for them to, uh, yeah. to enter this. So um, at current stage, the government is um, making um, lots of um, progress trying to uh, help those small scale farmers to uh, probably they can uh, join those um, big corporate, but still we don't know if that's going to be uh, good or bad for those small scale producers because you know, you their uh, livelihoods may be deprived because of that they join in the big companies. And uh, so, yeah, I think 
that that could be an issue. We are still looking for how to how to minimize the social impact on those small scale producers. So uncertain times, and I wonder if there are lessons there from uh, terrestrial livestock production, for example, what's happening there. Thanks very much, panelists, and and for those questions. Uh, we're coming towards the end now, and I'd like to introduce Jin Leap who's the co-director co of the Center for Ocean Solutions, Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, will give us some closing remarks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Dave, and, and thanks to the panel for a very stimulating discussion. It's hard to close a discussion like that and, and adequately capture the value um, of the things you've said, but I wanna highlight a couple of threads that struck me. 20 years ago, the paper that Roz led in Nature highlighted the daunting sustainability challenges facing the aquaculture sector. And, and you see from the comments from Jose and Ling in particular, huge progress has been made in the last 20 years to tackle those fundamental sustainability challenges. And what strikes me now are the comments that Pip made. You know, what are the challenges, the central challenges going forward? And how do we build an aquaculture sector that is serious about SDGs one and two, right? About cracking hunger and about cracking poverty. And what are the innovations needed to meet those challenges? And how do we create the investment vehicles that allow us to do that because the market won't do it on its own? How do we create the governance structures that foster the kind of production that is good for livelihoods, that's good for nutrition, that's good for equity, right? And, and I think that's a really interesting set of, of problems for us to be focused on now as we think about what have we learned and how do we apply that energy and creativity to, to building the aquaculture sector that we need. Um, so I think a very stimulating set of ideas coming out of this discussion. And in that context, I'm gonna take this, this opportunity to also highlight a project underway to go after that set of questions. It's the Blue Food Assessment convened by Stanford and the Stockholm Resilience Center. Roz is the co-chair. Several people on the screen are lead authors, including Dave, um, in that effort. Uh, and it's it's an effort to get at the many dimensions of aquaculture, the challenges and opportunities, and to provide the scientific foundation for bringing aquaculture fully into discussions about the future of food. So watch for those papers in the Nature Journals in the summer and bringing all of this into the UN Food Systems Summit in September. I think an important time for us to be thinking about how we build aquaculture over the next 20 years. And thanks, Dave. Thank you very much, Jim. Yeah, so what a, an exciting time to be in the sector. Um, I'd just like to close this session by thanking all our panel members for this fruitful and timely discussion. Perhaps uh, you'll see them now as they come on screen, um, as well as all of you who've chose to follow us and participate virtually in, in, in our deep dive around this nature paper today. I think it's been great. I'd like to thank Armin Sturm, Susan Fitzer and Alex Pounds uh, here at Sterling and the team at Stanford for supporting this seminar. We hope you've been inspired and taking something useful from this discussion. It's just been an hour, but we hope you can apply it every day in your work, research, individual collective action for shaping positive change in the world through fish and aquatic foods. We'll make the recording of this seminar available to all registered attendees and pass on details of the next Big Fish seminar, series seminar that will be on the future of aquaculture governance held in partnership with Wageningen University provisionally sometime towards the end of April. So with that, have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay in the sector. We finished. Thank you. <laughs>